Hello, everyone, and welcome to the next episode of the Caterpillar podcast. Tonight, we have a reoccurring guest, Yusro. You want to Hello. introduce yourself? Yes, I'm Yusro. I mostly hang out at twitch.tv forward slash Yusro, Y-U-Z-R-A-L. And I can be found playing all variety of games, everything from Star Citizen to 40k Chaos Gate to the occasional World of Warships and really anything that just takes my fancy. There is also a YouTube channel, youtube.com forward slash usual, which gets occasional updates these days. I'm mostly a Twitch guy and have been for the last few years. Well, we, we thought it was uh, appropriate to, to have you back because this is not quite on the anniversary of, of uh, being, uh, being going for a year, but, you know, close enough. So, yeah, a whole year already. Indeed. Somehow. And they haven't lynched us yet. Wonders will never cease. <laughs> <laughs> Not so, eaten by cats just yet. No, no. I'm sure our feline, o well, your feline overlords will make their move at some point. <laughs> but not today. So today we have a little bit of news and then we might just start talking about more or less the last year of warships. But first, with a little bit of news we have, there is a new article about the economic bonuses with a lot of mouth that nobody cares for and that's probably going to change. There are a few interesting tidbits, I feel like, questions that people might have had, like what will happen with permanent camouflages not bound to a certain ship? And the answer is basically they're going to split the uh, camo and the economic bonus and you can choose to apply the economic bonus to one ship and the yeah, camo to another. Indeed. And this is welcome because, let's face it, how many times have we picked a camo that perhaps we didn't aesthetically care for, but we really, really wanted those bonuses? Particularly the plus credits camos, for example. Mm. If you just needed yeah. that silver and you were rummaging around, okay, oh, I'm down to that. Okay, it's not my taste, but you know what? I'm looking at the enemy, not my own ship. Yeah, and if you have, like, one of these... What was it from, from a uh, Halloween event or from uh, something like that? There were like those uh, water world camels or whatever, I think, where you could get them and then apply them to any ship you like, or at least a certain tier. And if yeah. you have one of those still lying around and you never wanted to use it because of the look, you can now use just economic bonus for the ship of your choice after the change. Indeed. So that, that's actually kind of welcome to my mind. And oh, yeah. As for the maths, well, we'll see. Yeah. <laughs> we yeah, this will is all still see. very much in progress. Um, I, I imagine Mouse is going to sit down and thoroughly bash this into submission if she hasn't already. But as we all know, this is completely up in the air and open to change. At some point, I might get around to sitting down with a calculator as well, but haven't been bothered thus far. I mean, the problem with this is who would want to do all this work when it's subject to change and then two weeks later they're like, oh, wait, it's, it's totally different. I feel like none of us is that enthusiastic about this. <laughs> Not yet, at least. Um, that being said, you can also point out that perhaps some of us should, and I know there'll be a few who will, because... Uh, when it's still in development, is the right time to squeak and go, hey, um, could you tweak this like so because X isn't working right? Or if you put X and Y, you get a paradox. True. So there's there's an argument for sitting down and doing it at some point. I just have had far better things to do thus far. Also, by the way, I've said the expandable camouflage, most of them will be just available for credits. So they said something about especially rare ones or uh, I think certain partnerships or so that might not be available, but most of them will just be available for credits and the credit depends on how artistic they are, I suppose. I suppose. How do you go about judging that though? Mm. I mean, they possibly, just say possibly a rarity thing. They did say there's definitely single color standard camos, 
So standard would be what we currently regard as the basic vanilla. So the type one, the type two, the type five, etc. Yes. Um, then you've got the single cameras. Then they say the abstract stuff. So Ocean Soul and French Riviera. And then the artistic ones are the really gaudy stuff. So they cite the Union Jack camo, for example, as being artistic <laughs> and are saying that's going to be 90,000 credits. I am forced to point out the usual disclaimer about anything regarding aesthetics. It is entirely a matter of personal taste. And unless the censors get involved, there is no hard yardstick on this. So it really will be, you know what, to each their own. Yes. I mean, they charge you 75,000 credits for Ocean Soul. <laughs> they have to pay me money to put that look on. Well, this is why they're separating off the economic bonuses. So. I mean, yeah. Ocean Soul, the infamous uh, Pantsouflage, that that had a thing because oh, that was one of the first hundred XP, hundred percent XP camos, wasn't it? If memory serves, oh, yeah. that was why everyone ran it back in the day, despite all the jokes. Mm. So yeah, those those will be a thing of the past, unless you don't want them to be, in which case you do you. Indeed. Then so. there, there is also an update to like uh, daily containers. Basically, there will be yeah a couple more categories essentially. Yeah, yeah. I I think the fact that they now have an explicit more coal will make yeah. a lot of people very very happy. Um, but they also separate. We also have a new more bonuses category as well. So that I think. Yeah, again, more choice, more flexibility. I think that will make a fair chunk of the player base that little bit happier as well. So that is yeah. to be welcomed. Um, on the topic of artistic, interesting takeaway from the latest round of the Azure Lane promo is that Wargaming may be sharing assets with Manju and Yostar, but they don't seem to be sharing release schedules. Because the last big Azure Lane update apparently dropped Vanguard, Jervis, and Indomitable as ship girls. And okay. then Wargaming do this promo, which features none of them. And you'd think if they were cooperating closely, they'd have lined that up for maximum impact. Hmm. So I'd say they may be showing assets, but we got Aurora, we got Azima, we got a few voice packs, and I was actually puzzled by Azima. I felt sure they would have done AL New Jersey because she was one of the last big ship girl releases as well. But but that isn't really a New Jersey in game, is there? Iowa class. I suppose. I mean, I oh, suppose you could okay. have it as a skin for the Iowa, or even that's what they did. Yeah. Uh, you've, there are skins for Indomitable and New Jersey, so they kind of nod, nodded Indomitable, but as I say, if, if I had been running this co collab, I would have lined up Vanguard and Jervis and gone the whole hog just to try to maximize the revenues there. But hey, that's just me. Well, I mean, Wargaming is... Not necessarily known for the competence in those matters. <laughs> well, yeah, I mean, they have... We've seen some changes on that front over the last year, haven't we? Let's... We'll probably have a lot to say on that later on. Probably. Um, probably. Uh, the other thing of note, of course balance changes and before we go into these as calls if you ha if you have somehow been under a rock for the last couple of weeks replays have a security vulnerability in them yes yes so basically that don't open replays unless they are only completely trust the source in fact I would go even for that just don't open replays you might trust the source but you don't know where the source got it from Yet that comes with trusting the source, right? To like if you have a good friend that also plays ships and they are sending you one of their replays, I would go so far as to trust it. If, Unless, if it's of course, you consider your friend replays. is not trustworthy. 
If you know where they live, it helps. <laughs> well, so you can go around and beat them up after it, if it does something it, bad. It's, to the it's a long way up to the Hebrides. <laughs> <laughs> um, but no, I would say at this point, until Wargaming say they fix this, then the best thing is just not to open a third-party replay at all. Because... You're going to be on the extra safe side, and certainly yes. if you're or in the habit of going and looking at replays on the the, the official replay portal, you know. Best yeah, not I to do that at the moment. Yeah, I, I definitely wouldn't do that. Indeed. So, uh, where do we head next? Should we carry on with the round for the news, or...? Yeah, uh, yes. Not much. So there's uh, uh, test ship changes, which I guess we'll briefly skip over. It's mostly British battleships. Uh, 7, 9, and 10. Uh, which looks like they are nothing. Well, we rook's getting a slight damage nerf, but a slight buff to range. Uh, Duncan's getting a sigma increase, again, a slight buff to I mean, range, and Vincent again are, is the same. Are those the brawlers that are, well, that are getting buff? These, these are the battle cruisers. Well, yeah, but they, they said we, they wanted to test two. Uh, oh yes, versions right. Uh, Rook Duncan. I I don't remember either. Um, but probably uh, brawlers one... because Vincent has one point five sigma. That, that I hope they don't put it on a sniper. <laughs> mm, I mean, that's a what twelve barrel design. One one five sigma wouldn't be out of keeping for a twelve bore, for a twelve barrel shotgun. But I agree. Something like low at tier 10 would suggest the brawling line. Um, Iwami has also been boosted up. Uh, Interestingly, and... that is a brawler, so I'm not sure why they're giving it more range and... Uh, at the I Sigma, see, unless yeah. they've I'll decided to not go the brawling route after all. Maybe. I mean, 22k and 2.1 Sigma is is heading into sniper territory, bluntly. I yes. Mean, two, one, 2 1 Sigma is cruiser grade on a, on a BB. There's, there's yeah. not many battleships that can boast that, we'll put it that way. Yeah. No. I mean, that's... Once you have something that you have a 0 0.3, 0 0.4 sigma difference over the usual, which Iwami now has, you're going from... You'll notice it over a thousand games if you're little white mouse and collating statistics to... You might actually notice this in a single battle. Hmm. So... I wonder if we're seeing a shift of emphasis there. Um, and Aquila's torpedoes are getting a nerf. So Which huh. doesn't, doesn't tell us that that much. That one's still very much in. Uh, yeah, that, I've that, that's in the fairly early days of testing of the the Aquila still. I've met like two or so, but I don't remember. I don't think they necessarily attacked me, so I can't really say much about it. Yeah, and she's the first Italian carrier, quite possibly the only Italian carrier, because yes. she was the one that was nearest to completion. They they and, had, I think, it was Spaviento was in the works as well, but yeah, I think got did, even did we, less far did, along. Did we talk about this with Drac at some point? The possibility of Italian carriers, but it was it was it was either that or I looked it up myself, and yeah, there's there's not really a lot there. <laughs> But, no, you know, I mean, they managed to cook up an entire Soviet CV line, so... True. That might not stop them. It might not, but I know tequila is a premium, so... Mm, we'll see. Yeah. Um, and then there's San Diego, the ship that's been bouncing around the power levels like a veritable yo-yo for the past few test cycles. And they're, they're hitting her with a nerf bat this time. Um, 16 heavily, kilometers too. range down yeah. to 14.8 at tier 8. And bear in mind that Sandy is an Atlanta class, so we're not talking great ballistics either. This is the 5 inch 38 that we're all so familiar with. If anyone knocks out any more orbiting satellites, by the way, congratulations. Temple Investigations <laughs> want to know how you're shooting down satellites in 1944. But uh, yeah, SAP nerfed close to. 10% range nerfed by about 8%. Main battery reload is down from 50% increase to 33%. So that's a significant hit to the full auto DACA mode. 
And the only good news is that her airstrike range is now out to 7k, which might actually make it useful, vaguely. I mean, the, the thing with the reload booster is that I'm happy that I moved further away from this. Originally, this was planned as a ship purely relying on reload booster with unlimited charges like the, the Austin, right? And then they made the reload booster only have two charges, and now they're even nerfing it further. So it's yeah. going to be less gimmicky and hopefully more universally fun. Perhaps, Thanks that but what's her rate of fire at the moment? That I don't know. Because if they haven't changed that, and they originally conceived her baseline rate of fire based on, hey, you've got infinite charges of Red Bull for your gun cloders, <laughs> then only what? suddenly having two tins between eight turrets is going to cause a problem. I mean, I think with the original change where they like, reduced the reload booster, they touched on the reload. But it's yeah, been a while, it's... so... I would have to go back and have a look as well. So San Diego, we'll see, I think is the best option. Of course, none of us yeah. are in the test programs anymore, so we don't have first-hand experience. Well, I have to wait and see. Controversial premiums in terms of its announced stats, and it continues to be, I think. Yes, I mean, I, I've never seen Mouse get that worked up over an unreleased ship's stats before. Because she basically tore the whole design down and submitted a completely different alternative, didn't she? Mm -hmm. I mean, the original design was basically uh, worse than Atlanta ship at tier 8. Which is yeah. a very odd starting point to go like, what if we make the ship at tier higher but worse? And Wargaming tried to defend that design, uh, which because, you know, what if mouth is just wrong? And turns out and mouth was not wrong. And then got the sharp reminder that you do not criticize mouse's numbers unless you've got a small textbook worth to go for your own case, because mouse does not, mouse is not in the habit of getting her numbers wrong. Jeez. I mean, how many, how many other CCs use mouse as a reference point? Yeah. I know I do. Did, rather. So, we'll see. Like, they picked a very popular ship with, with uh, that's very interested, that has a lot of interest, right, in the US. And yeah. then they've screwed up the original design, and ever since then, they've tried to make it a weird gimmicky boat, and it's like, oh, we'll see. I hope that it's going... That they really should have gone for something not niche, but broadly... Uh, appealing because if you have a ship that that has some history in it and that a lot of people are interested in you should make it like accessible right and then you can yes. make paper designs with more niche things also or less mm, less yeah. known ships i mean if they were going to do a tier 8 atlanta they their starting point should have been atlanta but better that's so... a good starting point when you move up it here Yes, generally. Especially when you do the 7-8 jump, because suddenly you're playing with the big boys and girls. The very big boys and girls, now that super ships are a thing. Um, yeah, you, yeah, you can't even see top tier at, at tier 8, right? Like, now that we go up to 11. Well, sort of. <laughs> why, they, <laughs> why they did not just call it tier 11, I have no idea. Possibly because then they'd have had to put the carriers at tier 12. Mm. and thoroughly broken the matchmaking. Uh, speaking right. of super ships... Well, I, just, I... I just wanted to add there that, you know, although we do have Flint and they've announced San Diego, if, if they really wanted to do something wacky with the, the platform, you know, there were eight Atlantas in total, so they could pick one of the others, do the wacky thing on that and do something a bit more... Uh, or, or a bit less controversial, shall we say, with uh, San Diego, which is... Kind of like for for for, for British viewers slash listeners is uh, I, I guess the equivalent of, of like war spike in terms of just having lots and lots of battle mm -hmm. honors. Uh, she is joint second, Enterprises first, okay. uh, San Diego, and oh god, what's the other one? There was there were two of them that ran up. I think it was thirteen battle stars. Give me a second to check. It's a very, very decorated ship is what I'm getting at for, for pe people that don't necessarily have the context of why it's so controversial. Yeah, yeah and so... I think they're probably also aiming for a 4th of July release, I have a feeling. 
That would be the obvious point to do it. Actually, no, I'm wrong. It wasn't 13 battle stars. It was 18. Um, Enterprise, as I say, has the, I think she got something like 20, 21 or more. Um, the only other ship that has run up 18 battle stars. Oh, God, so you think this would be easy to find, wouldn't it? <laughs> Um, decommissioned operation. Yeah, sadly, started. there's no Wikipedia list for that. I don't think. No, that's why I'm having to rummage. You'd almost think the world isn't as nerdy about ships as we are. <laughs> <laughs> nah, that can't be right. Yeah. So yeah, Enterprise gets twenty, along with a presidential unit citation, navy unit commendation. Uh, San Diego is second with eighteen. San Francisco is sort of one behind um san francisco the cruiser gets 17 stars and a presidential unit citation o'bannon she of the potatoes is tied 17 and a citation new orleans and minneapolis both get 17 stars and then you have a slew of destroyers running down through the 16s and 15s and the sub stop popping up at 15 with the thresher so yeah, second most decorated ship in the US Navy of World War II. So yes, this is not a ship you want to screw up if you want the American audience to open their wallets as opposed to opening their wallets at the local pitchfork store. <laughs> anyway, I kind of sidetracked us, so yes, we're on to... Uh... Well, we're on to more US changes to Kansas yeah, Vermont branch. Buffs to yes, the and line. a fairly significant round of buffs. 40-second reload on Repair Party, with no downside. And it looks like Minnesota's thwart bulkheads have been thickened up, so that's going to make her harder to citadel from the front. Uh, I, I have to wonder if this, if this was a combination of unpopularity or if it's purely down to the stats, because it's certainly not a line of ships you see in-game all that often. Well, the two tend to go together. They're unpopular yes. because they tend yeah, to get that, farmed. That's, that's fair. <laughs> I mean, so, sometimes you get stat, uh, ships that like perform okay stat wise, but they're not like the most fun ship, so they don't you don't see them very often. And some of the premiums certainly fall into that category. Although obviously premiums, so you can see a few of those because people have to. I mean, pay I for think them. I think wargaming has gone with a very interesting approach there. So basically, the Kansas, the worst of the bunch, gets the least buffs, and the Vermont, the best of the bunch, gets the most buffs. Well, yeah, I mean, they may be a bit worried about overcooking the eight, the Kansas. But again, I mean, it's tier eight, it's playing with the big boys. So the, the, uh, you can't really overcook Kansas, is just crap. Like, Vermont is pretty yeah. strong because it finally has the, the caliber to overmatch in the test, is a very powerful broadside with decent performance at range. But they are going to buff its armor. They are going. It's going to have a heal that can heal citadels better, right? That's the only one of those ships. It's gonna get better concealment. Uh, okay, that said, increase the flight time of protectors for long distances. So maybe there are kind of a little bit of a downside there. So I, I'm looking sorry. at that combination change. I think they've increased the muzzle velocity, but they've dropped. But they've increased the drag factor as well. Probably. Looking at those changes. Um, they've also stealthed it, well, somewhat. It's only visible yeah. from low orbit now, as opposed to mm. geostationary. Uh, Caseway armor from 38 to 51. I'm trying to think what thresholds that crosses, because it's not going to do anything for overmatch. It's got to be a high explosive change. Yeah, is that going to yeah. be like 8 inch? 8 inch, eight 204 inch. millimeter. Eight-inch German high explosive. Okay, that's what they're setting it up to beat, because the Germans get the quad. Actually, does the German eight-inch get quad penetration, or is that on the one sixth? Because I know that hundred fifty gets quads, but that would be defeated anyway by thirty-eight. I think their cruisers do still, um, but don't. Quite... It, it's possible. I mean, it would be. It would just beat a quad. Uh, 8-inch high-explosive round. 
Um, 410 over 6. Would it defeat that? No. Not even... Rem uh, yes, actually, it would. Because 406... I'm, I'm going at this the wrong way. 50 time, 51 times 6 is going to give you a threshold value of 306 millimeters. So it's not going to beat regular Battleship HE at all. Yeah. It's, they're, they're raining in the cruiser high explosive, I think. Yeah, I'm just looking at it now. HE. So, like, US 8 inch is uh, 34 millimeters. On German ship, yeah. uh, is 51. So, it's, it's the German 8 inch HE still will be able to, but I think. Just? Oh, um, oh yeah, it was, equal, it was equal to, wasn't it? So, yeah, on the Minnesota, that's probably the bigger change. Um, Going from I wonder 25 if... to 38, that makes it more proof against 8 inch. Well, no, the Minnesota's change isn't won't affect HE because that's the thoughts on. Oh yeah, Super no, I didn't, I didn't that It's bit. the Vermont's <laughs> case, mates. Yeah, yeah. I thought they were trying to HE proof, but huh? You think they'd go for fifty-two millimeters if they were trying to HE proof against eight inch? Hmm. Yeah, still, still uh, vulnerable to Germans, then I suppose the German HE. Well, yeah, I mean, I mean sometimes they, they make weird changes with their numbers, so... Yeah, sometimes it's hard to fully understand why they make the changes they make. Yeah, I mean, the, Min the Minnesota change is fairly easy to read. That's setting it up so that if you're firing for, say, a cheek shot, like you would with a Yamato, now it's going to more likely to deflect off the forward thwarts instead, I think. Um, you're going to need... Well, you're not going to get overmatch there, not with 38 millimeters. So I think they're trying to cut down that vulnerability. Hmm. Um, and of course, the United States has had its jet squadron nerfed. Again? I've, I've Again. <laughs> they've sliced another 600 damage off the torpedo. And what 5% less flooding chance? Base flooding chance. Remember that all then. You then hit the whole black magic of all the modifiers. Hmm. Um, and this, this sub change, this is one I. It's either really, really significant as a nerf, or it's not as bad as I think, because it depends on whether the deviation for, say, U69, depends on whether the deviation is 11 degrees as a cone, yeah. or whether it's 11 degrees either side. Because a regular destroyer's dispersion is a six degree cone. The Holland's ultra narrow is a three degree, one and a half degrees either way. So that gives you a reference point. I mean, 11 degrees, five and a half degrees either way, if it's just the cone is. You're going to get destroyer style spreads at about half range, if I'm reading that right. But if it's 11 degrees error either way, a 22 degree cone, that's more like drunk torpedoes. I mean, I feel like the idea is that they want to make it harder for a submarine to nose up. Like if currently, if you're a destroyer and you sail towards a submarine, the submarine just one shots you through your nose and there's nothing you can do about it because it's a single launch torp towards your nose. But if there's yeah. a lot of spread by those torps and then you might be able to dodge and you might actually be able to reach the submarine and do something about it. Yeah, like they're, they're, they're explicit that they are trying to nerf the habit of, well, myself and everyone worked out very early on that the, your best option was just to get to two and a half kilometers and don't bother pinging and launch the unguided torps. Enemy yeah. gets no warning. And while they do still get the brown alert time, they don't have much random wonder to deal mm. with. So, as I say, that 11 degrees, 16 degrees on the U-2501, dear God, <laughs> very drunk torpedoes. Um, bear I in mind know. the normal destroyer's spread. I, I think they're calibrating it so that the spread width on a sub-spread is going to be about the same as a destroyer from maximum detection. Yeah, like, if, if they can't, like, have this line of torps coming towards you anymore, that means you can, like, if the... Uh launch unguided torps, that means they can't as easy shotgun you. You might have a chance to dodge now, although, I mean, they can still 
Scorpio your broadside because you can't see them coming, which in which case I'm not sure it matters that much if they're um, two kilometers away from you. It, it's a swings around its thing. I say that spread is so huge that it's going to look almost like just a single six launch from a destroyer tool. Yeah, true. Tube. But if they are very like if they are two kilometers from you, then single six you... launch will devastate you as well. Oh yeah, yeah, it'll still hurt if it hits, but that's kind of the point, really. I mean, but, if it didn't, what would be the use of a submarine? But the, the interesting thing I'm thinking about is, now let's assume you are actually pinging. This means that people who... It, it's a buff for people who don't know what they're doing, in a sense, right? Because you don't want the line of torps, kind of. You want them to spread out a little bit and then converge on the target, so you can't, like, dodge them. And this means that you get this natural spread by just launching directly at the target. That means the troops aren't coming all in a line, and that means they're going to be harder to dodge if if you ping. It could, yeah, you're going to potentially get torps spread out coming in on multiple vectors. Um, I'm not sure it's going to be a huge deal, but it will it will have a noticeable effect. Um, of interest is that the stern tubes are much narrower on their spreads for the top yes. submarines that have them. Or with the exception of U4501, which has 11 degrees on the bow and 16 degrees on the stern. So, uh, hmm, yeah. We'll see how that goes. Rumours, by the way, I don't think any of us are in a position to confirm or deny that rumour about 53 knots that Flamu was getting worked up about earlier this week. Mm. I mean, it's it's... It has, I think, 30-something base speed, right, and a speed boost or something? Yeah, that would do it. If it had a speed boost to the tune of about 80%. I mean, and, well, I should have Michael checked get... this earlier. There, there is a, like, Alban Kalito in... has a video in port. I think he might be showing the stats. Okay, well... See. Let me see if I can... But uh, the, the last thing we need is more subs when they can't even get the current subs right, so there is that. At least they haven't brought the Russian line back. So what do we have here? Yeah, the thing is, what's the maximum speed underwater? Ah, that, that's normal. So it's 20 knots on top of the water, but where is the underwater maneuvering? Okay. Oh, it's, it's 43.1 knots base speed underwater. 43.1. Okay, I mean, the 4501, if memory serves, did have an experimental peroxide drive. It was very quick underwater. It was also hilariously loud underwater, which is why, aside from a few experiments in the 50s that the British did, peroxide drives are kind of not a thing. Um, and that and the whole thing about hydrogen peroxide doing bad, bad things to human flesh if it comes into contact. Yes. Um, high t in fact, I think they were actually using high-test peroxide in that experimental fuel it's system. Bad. As an interesting, completely non-submarine-related -submarine side note, our, the, the UK's foray into uh, uh, it, its, its uh, development of, of uh, a rocket system was also heavily based on HTP. Well, I think there are still some commercial rockets today that use HTP. It is very, very good at going whoosh. Mm. It's also worryingly good at a number of other things, which is why nobody really uses it unless they've got no other alternative. But yeah, we did do a couple of experiments in the 50s with an HTP-based fuel system or drive. And as far as I remember correctly, the performance was great, but you could hear it miles away. So we basically canned it. And that was before the safety regime pointed out that, hey, you have a fuel here that melts human flesh. Mm. Good luck. So, it, it doesn't look like it has speed boost, but there is a skill that you get underwater 18% more speed if you have less than 50% dive yeah. capacity, and you can mount and a speed then flag. And put speed flag on it. Okay, so uh, what, what was the base speed? 43.1. 
Okay, so Sierra Mike is what, 10%? So that's going to get you 4.3, so 47.4 knots. I mean, that's and, already stupidly fast. And you can get 18% faster. <laughs> if you're on your last legs with regards to dive time. Well, uh, you have to be less than half. That's not just hard. There oh, is still okay, quite well, that's quite <laughs> a bit of dive time left if you economize. Please tell me it doesn't come with the uh, oxygen, with the battery extender that the other German U-boats get. Uh, of course, it, it has... Let me see. Yeah, it looks like it has the the battery extender. Oh boy! <laughs> so just just so you know, you you can get your yeah. You can outrun yeah. some torpedoes in this thing if you are low on dive capacity. Yes, yes, this is true. You'll be outrunning the Italian sea mines. Um, I'm more concerned about the fact that you'll be outrunning virtually every destroyer in the game. And that's before you hit the emergency boost. Because 47 knots, even with Swift in silence, how many destroyers get 47 knots? I'm thinking of the Russians, the French. I mean, maybe Swift in a, silence, you're going to be Fletcher. spotted by the submarine, so you aren't going to be so silent. Yeah, there is that as well. So, um, hmm. Who wants to bet that is first up for the nerf? Mm. <laughs> I'm actually uh, just reading about that. I wasn't aware of this, this, this type of submarine previously. Uh, type 26, apparently? I, 26. But, I think Which sometimes five, call it the five were laid down but none completed. But uh, yeah, yeah, it had sideways sort of facing torpedo tubes. Which is I don't know how they're going to manage that. Um, Four forward facing and then six kind of. I think it was three on back. either side of the hull, and yeah. they were like side mounted packs. I never did find out if those tubes could be reloaded or if they were one shot deals. I think historically they might have been one shots. Probably. Because the design's going to make it really awkward to reload them. Not impossible, but I think it was a consequence of that so much of the sub was engine that um, they kind of forgot where to put the uh, stern torpedoes. And mm -hmm. mind you, the Type 21 didn't have any stern tubes, so somebody clearly looks at that and go, you know, it would be nice if we could fire something other than just straight forwards. <sighs> I I mean, it's an interesting concept, but <laughs> I still think they might have been better off just having it as a submarine with engine boost. Uh, to, but, uh... <sighs> yeah. I mean, they really should just get them. That's, what I'm afraid of is that Wargaming really thinks that submarines are almost close to being ready because... We don't see that big changes to submarines anymore, and now they come up with weird new things. And you you usually start with those until you got the basics right. They're uh, like, yeah, mm, sure, we yeah. can make a fifty knot submarine. That's that's perfectly fine. I I think the fact that they are considering a 45, 44 knot submarine as being fine is a red flag in and of itself. That said, I realize that the uh, dispersion change. Hmm. Sounds minor, but I really don't think it will be. That is I a very, that that is a rock, very sizable nerf. Just looking at Wikipedia, it says it says forty three kmh, but that's only twenty three and changed knots. So yeah, yeah I but a, if... a lot of the subs we have in game are faster than they were historically. Anyway, so yeah. I, there's something. I mean, even even if you take, I mean, a Balau does what close to 30 on the surface in game and historically it was 20 so if you assume there's about a 50 percent boost mm. you should still only be breaking 33 34 knots with a sierra mic on this thing i mean that's still enough that a destroyer is going well the japanese destroyers which do 35 are going to be going wait for me mm. <laughs> um and of course it doesn't help that mm. a lot of the destroyers don't have a forward-firing anti-sub armament. 
very few in fact have only a yeah. couple of the yeah. uh, the, the pan europeans have them yeah so you now have a submarine that is doing ludicrous speed if not going to plaid and is you have to overtake it significantly because the depth charges have that floaty time yeah in order to attack it I mean, it's not just that. If you want to drop it with planes, this is going so fast that giving enough lead time for the planes is going to be very it's, tricky if you encounter this. It's going to be an interesting exercise in guesswork, yes. But to be honest, the way a lot of people aim their depth charge planes at the moment, it's already an interesting exercise in guesswork. Uh, I True. But it's going to make have, it a it lot harder. An imp it will have an impact. I'm just not sure how much of one uh but um yeah i i realize sergeant sully is saying yes flamu has a tendency to troll but i think for once unusually flamu and i are in agreement that this is just a <laughs> teensy bit busted there may or may not be dissenting well. voices on the point I think we, we most everyone agrees these days that submarines are busted and that you know uh, we don't need fifty knot submarines. Well, well, you know I've joked previously well, about there being like a you know Papa class or an Alpha class or something. As a, <laughs> the Alphas a, wish they could do that. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I still think they should make detection radius proportional to speed. That would be an interesting uh, approach. <sighs> yes. Well, um, before our blood pressure goes any higher. Yeah. Oh, did we mention about the acceleration change to the the battleship? The, I think yes. Did. Yes. Oh, we did. Okay. Well, we yeah. mentioned it in passing, but yes, the battle wagons will now be accelerating a bit. It, it amuses me that they kind of explicitly said they weren't going to get the the improved um, energy retention that the Colorado New Max used to have, and then they, you know, even took it away from them. But now they're like, okay, these these are too slow, <laughs> too unresponsive. I'm going to have to give them something back. Well, look at it this way: they got there in the end. Yes. I mean, we were only telling this from beta, but we got there in the end. Kind of appropriate for the battle wagons, really, isn't it? Yeah. <laughs> yes, slow, very slow, <laughs> but sort of steady, I suppose. Um, now, now we just need to wait another 12 months and we might get something done about the Italian battleship guns. But, you know, let's, oh, let's not get too wild with anticipation and optimism, I suppose. I mean, in fairness, yeah. you can. There is kind of historical justification for the Italian <laughs> guns being not. a bit kind wonky. Not. I mean, from what Drax says about the powder charge QC, it's. Um, in fact, I think there's been some studies, some after action studies, which basically, yes, when you plot the fall of shot against of some Italian guns, their aim was dead on. Their target was right in the middle of the shell pattern. But the shell pattern was so hideously bad that it looked like they were firing cross-eyed drunk. Uh, but, yeah. Um, oh, yes, the only other note on the subs is that the tier 8s have had their grace timers nerfed a bit, although they don't say by how much. Yeah. I mean, it's what they should just do is that you need a certain amount of dive time left to be able to dive, I feel like. It's, it's just weird that it's like, oh, you have two seconds of dive time left so you can go down, and then obviously it will force you back up again, but you can basically, oh, with only a few seconds of dive time, just already start yeah. dodging. Yeah, the, the dolphin diving is kind of irritating the beep, 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 beep. Um, yeah, that would make sense. Or if they just say, right, your grace timer does not refill. But again, that doesn't really address the problem you're pointing out. Once you have three seconds of dive time, it's kind of, get back down, quick. Although I'd note that really that's just delaying the inevitable. Well, I mean, it depends if, if uh, like on the, on the general situation, because 
possible that the ship that changes uh, that chases the submarine is getting found because it's getting spotted, right? So the submarine mm-hmm. only needs to survive long enough to to for its spotting to do its thing. Yeah, or it just needs to run a map, a score timer, or a clock, or yeah. some description. Just pray that something intervenes. I, I feel like, yeah, there should be something like maybe 10, 15 seconds or so dive time is needed once you're on this, uh, the, once you're getting up until you can go down again, just so that the sub is forced to actually spend a little bit of time on the surface. And it wouldn't make any sense to dive if you only can dive for a second or two anyway. True enough. True enough. Yeah, that's not a bad change. Yeah. So I think that pretty much brings us up to speed on the current news. Pretty much, yeah. Oh, do we want to cover this business article thing as well? The, or, the or report of Belarus? Like well, I mean, it's, it's yes. a lot of speculation. It's really worth but... mentioning it in that it's like the first any kind of news we've had in a bit about the, True. the, the goings on behind the scenes with the studios. True. Okay. Um, do you want to drop the link into chat then, Joe, so everyone in chat yes. can follow along? can do that. Uh, yeah, I, I already have it. Oh, I'm too slow. So basically, this is an article, and it, it, the, well, the headline says that they plan to relocate 30% of the staff, and the others are just getting canned. Now, this is for the Minsk office, so for the tanks, not, not the ship side, I like to point out. And in this article, it seems that a lot of that might be some speculation, so take anything here with a Rain of salt. Personally, I would take it with the minds of the, the entire annual output of the salt mines. Some of these <laughs> rumors appear to be in direct contradiction of each other. Yeah. But, uh... Yeah, so um, what do we have? So the first rumor is that everyone in Minsk was laid off, gone, fired. Cheers, though. So long and thanks for all the fish. And then it says, okay, we're going to try and keep its key people, which would make sense if they've got limited resources to evacuate and they need to spin up a dev studio in um, less embargoed territory, I think is the best way to put it. Yeah. I mean, I have a feeling that maybe like they, they just take this, like uh, they interviewed people who who were working for Wargaming, maybe still are. And I presume that people are just like talking mostly about like their their department or their, their unit and somebody's like, hey, we, we got laid off all of us in our small little team and nobody got a relocation offer. Somebody from a different department might be like, oh yeah, they, they offered us this. And that's what I'm assuming because uh, as you pointed out, some of those stuff is contradictory. Yeah. Um... It makes a degree of sense because there's still no comment as to where Wargaming is planning to spin up its new studios. I mean, there are rumors floating around about Wargaming is renting properties in one country and setting up in another, or they're expanding the Prague office, or basically, think of a rumor, someone's probably spread it at some point. But the... uh... The impression seems to be that development is getting out of Russia and Belarus and the local studios are just being held under Leicester in a keep the lights on mode, as far as I can tell, which is what we were speculating when they first announced the move. So the, the, one of the funniest parts of the article is that two employees noted that Wargaming's leadership doesn't communicate with staff offering little to no information <laughs> options. <laughs> Uh, Which, yeah, I mean, her. considering the amount of like everything being up in the air, it's kind of not entirely unexpected, but it's also a little bit amusing. Let's be honest. Yes, yes. Um, Communication yep. has never been that strong. Soon. No, and it's interesting that apparently they have the same problems internally as they have done externally, at least to some degree. But again. This appears to be a very, very active rumor mill right now. So, yeah, there's a lot of guesswork involved. 
I mean, I'm presuming that those people who have been offered different shops might not be able to talk about them or who have... So most of the information is probably coming from the people who were laid off or who didn't take offers because then they, they can more talk about it. And of course, there is another fact which I don't know about, which is how hard is it to emigrate from Belarus? Probably not. Well, it's probably easier than Russia at the moment, but yeah. I mean, it depends where There's also been various sanctions against Belarus, not just Russia. Well, it's not even that. Um, It's to what extent could the Belarusian government make your life awkward if they realised you were leaving? Which may be another reason why Wargaming is keeping this on the down low. Yeah, but it's it's probably also matters in which country you move, right? Yeah, yeah, true. So there's going to... It, they may well have very good reasons to keep this quiet. And that would explain why Wargaming's leadership, if you are not in the chosen circle, appears to be saying nothing. I mean, honestly, it's just like Wargaming is usually saying, I, I think they aren't going to say anything until they have uh, everything running or working at, at the new thing. Like, war, communication has never been one of Wargaming's focuses, so they'll be like, Nobody needs to know, so nobody's going to know. Yeah, I. we were talking about this before the stream, but I'll repeat what I said. I think they are trying to do this studio move as invisibly as possible from a consumer point of view, so that there's no disruption to patch cycles, there's no disruption to content. Good luck to them if they can, um, if they can pull it off. I will be truly impressed because, depending on... I mean, they were typically working, what, two, three months ahead, maybe longer, depending on where their content pipelines were. But um, we're, what, a month into the transfer process now, more or less. I mean, you you also are on to a point with that, like, if if you go too public about all of this, it creates a lot of uncertainty for the player base. And the last thing you want is them not spending money because they're like, yeah, I could buy this new premium, but I'm uncertain with uh, what, what's happening in the future, so maybe I'll hold off. So if you maybe. make it more invisible, right, and just pretend everything is going fine and there is nothing to worry about, then customers are more likely to not be concerned and keep spending money. Especially the ones who don't watch the company's internal moves and politics like we do. The the vast majority who just log on and shoot some boats. And maybe drop some premium every now and again. Mm. Because that's probably a good chunk of their audience, if not the vast majority of it. And I think they're the ones that Wargaming wants to not notice that something has significantly happened. So we'll see, but I think if there is going to be a wobble, we're going to see it either middle of this month, if 15.5 delays, or going into July of 15.6, as they start to run through their stacked content. I mean, we've already seen like the death block slow down a lot recently, so... I presume yeah. they are running out of, of new stuff to announce and they're still working off what, what they have. Yeah, and as you say, they're just slowing down with maybe starting to see the first few little wobbles as they try and move. I mean, they are trying to move to A-list studios, basically, mm. and that is not a trivial effort. So if they can pull it up, I mean... More credit to them if they can pull this off. It's um, yeah. As far as I can tell, that, 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 that there hasn't been that much disruption really on the World of Tanks side easier. But it's it's kind of harder for me to say because I I only dip into World of Tanks occasionally. So yeah, yeah. I mean, th- this is why you have a dev pipeline that basically stacks at least a month or two's content ahead. So that if something does hiccup you have got a bit of a buffer to work with. And this is a pretty major hiccup. Definitely. So, yeah, as far as... I think that pretty much runs us on the company latest company shenanigans. Of course, it wraps up a year that has been eventful. For everyone in World of Warships, doesn't it? Oh, yes. Yes. I mean, when we started this podcast, we were still actually CCs, for one thing. 
It definitely. Yes. So um... a lot has happened last year. I think one of the first things last year that happened, or first big things, was like the the captain skill change, right? Which is something that we've discussed a few times last year because there were then further updates and changes on it. But I think it was also one of the first topics we covered on this podcast. I'm not sure when, when exactly did they remove Dead Eye. Because Dead Eye was removed about two months after they released it. And when they what did, when did they release the Captain's Case in like March or something last year? Something like, I mean let's be honest here. A few people did miss Dead Eye when it was gone, but I mean the general theme has been that for all we like to complain and comment with the possible exception of submarines and the supercarriers, which I still sh- say should be tier 12 and just off in their own little pit, um, the game is actually not doing that badly at all, is it? Uh, well, I, I would say we're on a vaguely upward trend. Oh, I would say we are on a downslope. Oh, I would well, say if we are on a, on a pretty, pretty steep downslope. I mean, but, there are certainly large elements that I kind of... I, we were sort of chatting about this before we started, so there's, there's things around like the monetization, for example, and I was actually talking a bit about this in my most recent video, about um, I, it, it's actually now, if you look at it, pretty transparent even compared to what a lot of AAA companies do with like actual full price titles that are still chock full of microtransactions and Oh god, yes. Um, I mean, Blizzard are heading to get their fingers burned again with Diablo Immortal if some of the rumours coming off that title are set to be believed. Things like banned in Belgium and the Netherlands because it's yes. considered to be too much like gambling. It's and... actually been um, in the news, and this is sort of tangentially related, but um, there's been a, a, yet another kind of vague step towards um, possibly legislation sort of on a European oh, level with a bunch oh, of... Oh, yes, the, the regulators got together. Regulators sort of started getting... You know, getting some reports saying, yeah, you know, these, 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 this kind of loot box mechanics can be psychologically damaging and, you know... Yes. Yeah. They, they, um, they sort of inherently prey on uh, vulnerable people. Yeah, which is one of the things, of course, that pretty much, not quite a year ago, 11 months, set off the whole mutiny on the Missouri and the Great CC riot. Hmm. Um, well, I would so, say that and the treatment of mouse. For me, it was yeah, more I, about yeah, that kind of, than about the gambling It was generally. kind of a confluence yeah. of events that yeah. I, I think mouse was really the touch paper for a lot of people. Uh, well, a lot of us had, for a lot of us, the Missouri was the final straw. Hmm. And Mouse just, Mouse's treatment just took it from a, well, let's see what they do. And if they listen to us before we do anything drastic, to a, screw this, like the blue touch paper and stand back. Um, and in fairness, the end result of that, after 11 months of varying degrees of explosion, does seem to have been a better wargaming. Yes, I, I, I mean, I give you that, right? They, they have gotten better when it comes to disclosing the odds and things like that. And that they've well, at least said that they're now going to have no longer loot box only ships. There will always other options yeah. to buy a ship and so on. So they have uh, gone better on that front. They have gone mostly downhill, I feel like, a lot of it. Gameplay. Well, there were some decent changes, like they've finally replaced Epicenter with, with uh, Arms Race, but we've been waiting for a long time. Their mm. map, well, I mean, they have been talking about this map for a year now. We still don't have it. The second map that they, they talked about never existed. So they are dabbling in new game modes again, like with, with Convoy, and now they are reworking Convoy and trying to make it something yeah. fun again. So there are some positives, but the, the problem I feel like is that. While they start to, to go into the right direction again in some things, like the whole submarine disaster is gonna 
Yeah, I think this ship. Right, if they... that, that is that is the biggest besmirchment, as far as I'm concerned, at the moment is yes. the ongoing state of submarines. It's kind of worrying, stroke alarming, stroke depressing. That mm. right as they get their business practices sorted out, the game design starts side suddenly starts to pop some leaks. Um, we'll see, but uh, it may well be that. Bear in mind, they do that. Production pipeline is what months long. At what point can they say how long is it going to take them to say okay, from going to saying this is not working to actually pulling the plug? And I mean, the question is, is, will they ever pull the plug, or will they just think yeah. it will work some? Yeah, that's the thing. Um, and I think the only thing we can do in that respect is keep feeding back and saying either okay, this. There's going to be a large crowd that is always going to say, this will not work, this is bad, get rid of it. Problem is, Wargaming are going to be deaf to that, and because there's always a crowd that says that. Hmm. I mean, there is a large crowd that says carriers should be taken out, and if you go back to the early, early days, there was a fairly large crowd that was getting pretty vocal about torpedoes and cruisers and destroyers and can we have world of battleships please hmm. I think so, there's still, there's still probably some people I, like I think there's out, still though. a large and vocal crowd on yeah. that point yes um, but the problem with that just get rid of it response is that while it may be the right thing wargaming is so used to it that I suspect it almost just registers as background noise to them. maybe yeah um, which is True. a pity because I mean the the only thing that they probably listen to is like the actual player numbers if they see them dropping a lot. That that's something that they might listen to, but they, yeah. they're pretty deaf to feedback. Well, they're deaf to that kind of feedback, I think. Um, because they hear it so often and so often it turns out to be, well, actually it worked out. So um slash shrug. Of course, eventually someone tells you you shouldn't do that because you're about to step on the landmine, and it turns out that you actually are about to step on the landmine, and you step on the landmine. And I think we might be heading there with subs because they've had to do so much to subs to get them mm. vaguely competitive that, as a lot of people have commented, what we've got now is okay, these are performing more like 1950s subs even some 1960s stuff. I mean, we joke about the four, five, tens speed as something modern submariners would like to be able to do. Yes, as yeah. Tom McKay says, hmm, I cannot hear the screaming anymore, so must not be a problem any longer. <laughs> uh, and he's got a solid point there. They have been listening to the screaming for so long, it's just background noise and they've tuned it out. And for once, the screaming actually has a good point. Hmm. Yeah, <sighs> we'll see. Like, of course, it's... if submarines are yeah. going live, I wonder how many people are just sticking with it now, or how many people might have already quit, or how many people are sticking with it now because they feel like maybe submarines are going to turn into something less problematic. If they're going to release it, I really wonder if it's going to hit them with the player numbers or not. Imponderables, imponderables. Um, we have no real way of knowing, and that's the problem. Ultimately, yes. wargaming have no way to be sure either. The only way to actually find out will be to do it and see what happens. Problem is, if it does break stuff, is it going to break it in a way that's in any way fixable? And of course, if they do yank it, well, somebody's going to have to go to Cyprus and say, by the way, we have just shit canned a project that has been on the go for three years <laughs> and has consumed God knows how much in the way of dev resources. Oh, and by the way, we've stopped Ooh. developing the game for three years just so we could do this. So we, we, we've screwed up everything else along the way a bit. Well, they certainly tanked map development for the best part of two years, didn't they? Because they had to remaster about half the maps in the game. Yeah, I mean, they, they stopped map development. They stopped a lot of game modes. They've... Uh, they haven't, I mean, it's not like they were ever that great, but they haven't really rebalanced old ship lines a lot. They've started a little bit last year for the old ship, but they haven't really like kept 
like the the thing is the more ships you end the more you need to rebalance the the older stuff right uh, keeping the balance in a game like this is a constant process but wargaming is more like yeah no i to an extent although i'd note that a lot of the old ships are still very competitive i mean credit to wargaming you can pull out something like an otago or a turpitz from back from launch and they are still pretty competitive it, ships. It's funny how a lot of the, like, OG freemiums, actually, yeah, they are actually, they're, they're still fairly competitive. It's when you get to the kind of, when there were the more kind of gimmicky ones mm -hmm. um, yeah. that, that a lot of them you just don't see very often or they're, they're, they're fairly weak or just forgettable. I mean, things like... Um, Chris uh, could have yeah. used something ever, ever since the stealth fire... Uh, removal that that ship could have used some love, but they have ignored it entirely. There's, mm. there's all sorts. I mean, uh, yeah, the, the uh, Fen Yang should not exist. Yeah, Fen Yang, <laughs> um, um, Java, Hill. Although Hill was kind of a giveaway ship, so I guess, but yeah, yes, um, um, Genova. I mean, they did yeah. attempt to bring Kitakami back. Yes, that was the whole yes. that attempt. But, yeah. <laughs> Why they took her up to tier 10, I'm not uh, sure. I mean, the funny thing is, is that with torpedo-friendly fire gone, the biggest argument for keeping Kitakami out of the game You, you could still turn pit yourself, and that's still possible. And you can but at least you're not going to sink half your own team. <laughs> yes. yes, you can still sink yourself, <laughs> but uh, which I actually saw happen the other day, which reminded me that, yeah, it could still happen. Somebody in a battleship somehow managed to... They must have just been continuously shooting their allies to turn pink and actually did enough damage to themselves to sink themselves. That's an achievement. These yeah, days. yeah. Kind yeah of you, usually you're just a carry if you want to sink yourself. Yeah, the worst you get is a warning and maybe you forfeit the bonuses. Actually nailing yourself is... Um, hmm. Yeah, like, I mean, a carry can takes... cope itself pretty easily. Other ships... Need yeah, to be the carriers have always been able to do that, but that takes real dedication in the battleship. Uh, so well, yeah, um, I mean, but, I uh, have I, on on that note. I feel like I have noticed that the community in general is getting more toxic in the battles. Um, I've realized that I'm getting a lot more reported, no matter what I do, how well I play. Like even games that I carried and won, I got reported from their own team, and I've realized, for example, a lot. Especially like if you're a destroyer and there's a submarine, like your team is like, go kill that submarine. And I'm like, I can't spot it. I have no tools to, to hunt down that submarine. And they're like, oh, report destroyer, right? And I've been insulted a couple of times because I didn't magically detect or sink a submarine and things like that. Because a lot of people seem to be of the mindset that destroyers counter submarines, which they don't. And then if you don't do it, then they're going to be mad at you while they are hiding two maps behind an island because they're so scared of the submarine. And I mean, not, not just that, but generally speaking, I feel like it's a lot more tense in chat these days. Um, I, think this, this one, I think that's quite a subjective... I don't know if I've especially noticed that, to be honest. I was just, like, I still, there are still battles I, that stand out where people are just slagging off each other, but I don't know. You get the occasional... In any PvP game has... presence. <laughs> I, I wouldn't say that. <laughs> um, possibly just unlucky with your recent yeah. teammates. Very, very, very Well, in, in, in the recent two months. But I did notice but... that uh, since, since the submarines, I'm getting a lot more reported in destroyers, which is not yeah, has uh... to do anything with my gameplay. That is not people realistic. miss. That is people not necessarily being so much au fait with submarine and destroyer gameplay as it is hearing what is being said and coming in with their own preconceptions. Um, to a large extent, that is a player problem, not a war gaming problem. But it does imply again that there is something very badly wrong with where submarine design has gone in that it's not True. lining up with expectations and 
the history to an extent. Problem is, if you do make it line up with the history, the subs are completely useless because this was the issue with fleet submarines historically, all the way from the K-class through to the Balaos and onwards. This is why submarines are now commerce mm. raiders and ambush predators. They have never been able to function alongside a main fleet. It was tried repeatedly. It almost happened at Jutland, but the Ks didn't pull it off. I mean, that would be par for the course for the K-class, but um, <laughs> that's a whole other topic. Um, actually, on the historical, if we go down a rabbit hole mode, the lighthouse, has anyone managed to puzzle out who Ichiro Sato is? Because I have not been able to run that guy down. The is it is, the captain that is getting auctioned no. off? It's, well, it's the captain that's getting auctioned off, but he's not a naval officer. Oh, uh, I, I presume um, it must have been someone on the design side, or if it's just some kind of generic representation of the designers, or is it? Well, that was my know. first thought. I did a bit of digging. I could not find any reference. The problem is that both Sato and Ichiro are fairly common names in Japan, mm. as far as I can tell. So this guy is a sort of John Smith. I don't think it's quite that bad. Um, but I was just wondering if anyone else had had any luck in tracing this guy, because I thought he'd been part of the design team on the A140s, and that I'd be able to find a reference. But no. I mean, most of the references, you get Admiral Fukuda and his work, and pretty much nothing else. But uh, I may not have the right sources. That may... That may be a question for Drac, or if you ever get him, Alexander Clark. But they're both over in Canada at the moment, I believe. Yes, they are. Yeah. So I haven't actually on the like honestly, from the looks of it, I didn't pay much attention. I was like, looks kind of like an Indiana Jones, so it might just be a choker captain. Uh, I mean, that's the thing. I mean, that's just period appropriate dress for. Uh, yeah. But, but I, yeah, but it, it, because I didn't think originally, like it, it says they're brilliant engineers, so I, I felt like yeah, this is clearly not the naval camp. Right? But I didn't actually make the connection that it could just have been an engineer. But now yeah. that you mention it, it's actually interesting because you'd think if it's such a brilliant engineer, then we would then uh, have be a this information. Yes, <laughs> you'd think he'd have left thing, footprints somewhere. And as I say, I did some quick digging, but couldn't find anything. The problem is that the name seems, both names seem to be fairly common. Mm. Still, I mean, they're probably not that common of engineers in that year. But then again, we don't even know, like, was it a brilliant engineer, like World War II wise, World War One wise, what is uh, sort well, of engineering? Was, and the other problem, of course, is that all the design docks on the A140s were destroyed at the end of the war. Which, which, you does, know, it which does again, not have an excuse for just kind of fudging things as much as they please, I suppose. Yeah, but I, as I say, I, I, I assumed he was one of the principal engineers on the Yamato projects as well, but uh, I cannot find a thing on this guy. Admittedly, I only looked for about 45 minutes. That's actually a lot of time. Yeah, well, you know, you know me when I get a puzzle that gets my interest. See, the thing is, I, I just quickly tried to, to go, but you, you basically only get it's on Wargaming related things. Yeah. And something, uh, engineers that are unrelated with, with any ship things. It's yeah. weird. There, there is one reference to a chap of the name in a 1943 Japanese book on the Navy. I found okay. that buried in a bibliography of an article that was almost completely unrelated. Um, but without running down that publication, and then a translation of that publication, which was, of course, in Japan, in Japanese, in 1943, which poses certain practical difficulties. Uh, I don't know if it's the right guy or not. So, yeah, I, if it's not on the internet, you will not find the source. Quite possibly, Sergeant Sully, but um, 
I'm, I'm not Drac. I don't have access to things like the uh, archives at Q, for example. It's but also got the worry about the two um, the Midway missions at the moment that has um, both a Japanese and a, a US captain, and I don't know if those are actual captains either. I, I did a quick had... Google, and I can't really find anything. So I had not looked. Give me a second. Nathan Wyatt and what's the other one called? Tamio something. I didn't even realize that there were special captains for Gramps. Well, special. I think they're just yeah. unique portraits. I don't ah. think they're like six point captain or so is fine, but I think they're just unique portraits. Uh, yes. Tamio Yamazaki. Uh, Yamazaki. The problem, the problem is, again, those, those names could be generic. Yeah. Um, ironically, I, uh, I did just Google Nathan Wyatt, US Navy. Um, the first round of hits I got, possibly because I'm in the UK, was that Nathan Wyatt was one of the hackers who got jailed a couple of years ago <laughs> for trying to break into the US Navy's Probably computers. Probably not that, Nathan. Wyatt. Probably yeah. not him, no. Um, Yamaz Tamio Yamazaki. Give me a second. It's possible that they've just picked actually pretty common names because they're like, mm. yeah, could, could, could happen. And didn't, which is odd because you feel like there are so many. There are so many people who were actually there and who actually had yeah. influences that uh, it's kind of, why didn't you? Um, Maybe mm -hmm. they're, they're just too lazy to, to Google for portraits and then like, Render well, then, uh, somebody like they, they should look. You wouldn't think there would be rights and likeness issues, would you? <laughs> um, well, there's a Tomio Yamazaki, but he's an ice hockey player. Not him. Um, um, give me a second. I'm going to yank up the TROMs for the various Japanese carriers. Because the obvious possibility is that Yamazaki was one of the senior officers on one of the Japanese carriers at Midway. Mm. Or they've just pulled the name out of their hat. Like I said, uh, Ichiro Sato is, sometimes seems to be the Japanese equivalent of John Smith. Uh, yeah, it's, it, it's a sh uh, I feel like if... I feel like if they had picked like real people, they might have gone with a little bit more of an explanation or a text to it. Because like in the dev blogs recently, they, they write like almost large articles about we chose this name for this made up ship because, and then there is might actually be some interesting context how they came up with it. So it would feel to reason that if they actually pick a historic person, they would at least tell you what, what Take the, the opportunity to tell you the history and yeah. why they picked him. Um, buh, 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 buh. I mean, like the, the text to that brilliant engineer is uh, the brilliant engineer not only switched on the light for participants, but he also prepared new rules, like for the lighthouse auction. Like, I don't feel like you take a brilliant historical engineer and then say, oh, yeah, the this guy, he switched on the light for our lighthouse auction. It seems yeah, a bit... the, other, the other issue we've got is that, as I say, Yamazaki is another, as far as I can tell, fairly generic name. So I think, I think they have literally just picked plausible sounding names. Uh, right, order, midway Ooh, order Japanese battle. name. First result. Actually, what happens when you Google Japanese name? Mm. All right, there's a Captain Takaharu Miyazaki. No, that's not right. Right, okay, submarine group. We've really got another rabbit hole here. <laughs> yes, yes, this, hap <laughs> this happens. Okay, there was a rear Admiral Yamazaki, but he was commanding a submarine squadron. Um, and that seems to have been about it for flag officers on the Japanese side at Midway. 
So unless I am prepared to drill right down to captain names and start thoroughly searching the TROMs, which is going to take longer than we have time for, then yes, I think they've just pulled a Johannes McLean on us and not even given us the puns. It's entirely possible this too is just a kind of a generic representation. That... Yeah, which, which is kind of disappointing in a way because there are so many historical figures to choose from at Midway that mm. you can... Why? Why don't you? Israel wanders off into the desert. Yeah, possibly. See you in 40 days and 40 nights once I figured this out. <laughs> uh, he may be a famous fictional figure in Japan. He, again, possible, but the problem is that the name is just so, so generic. The other thing, of course, is I'm confined yeah. to English language sources. So I think... Uh, Without a lot more work that we do not have time for on this discussion, we're going to have to table this for a little while. So, uh, about, by the way, if we you did mention like the the uh, the German captain, like uh, McLean, right? So, yes, that's that's basically because it's the. Uh, it's the guy who does the German voice for Bruce Willis. Right. Oh, so right. So it's, that was it's why Mac, McClane from like oh, Die Hard. Oh, okay. Oh, that's now, bad. Now that's this bad. makes sense, yes. Oh, no, that, that actually hurts a little bit. <laughs> so, it, it, like, I mean, it's, it's a bit hit and miss, I guess, for people, but I find his lines are really funny. Yeah, I, I think if you, you, if you know really that detail, it, must, it makes more sense. Yeah, there must be people that do, because Germany especially does a lot of dubbing rather than subtitles, so there must be people yeah. who, yeah, I, I suppose you know, they're, they're famous as the person that does the voice for Schwarzenegger or whoever, so yeah. Well, well I suppose in that case Schwarzenegger could do his own German, but I don't know. Although doesn't he have like a really rustic accent in German terms? It doesn't help that he's Austrian rather than yeah. German, I suspect. All right, okay. Quick skim of Akagi's record of movement doesn't pick up anybody named Yamazaki as an officer. But problem is, this is the combined fleet's TROMs only list commanding officers. Uh, Sally, it's not that famous people have to have unique names. It's just that if this person was real yeah. and at Midway, he'd be a hell of a lot easier to find. Yeah, yeah. It's, Especially it's just... if he was significant. They're some kind of you know, if they were commanding yeah. some kind of vessel. It's not like we're not we're not talking some random sailor that you know. Yeah, nothing for manned the bilges or something. <laughs> Right, where are here you? Second story? cook's mate. That said, um, funny you should say that. The um, the chap they had. Oh lord, what was? Uh, there was a guy they had, and actually was a uh, steward, and ended up manning an AA gun at Pearl Harbor. Wait, no, I'm, scratch that. I'm conflating details. Uh, two different enlisted sailors. Um, there was a chap at Pearl Harbor, I forget the name, um, because he was black, he could only basically be a steward. Pearl Harbor ends up manning oh, an AA gun, and he yeah, gets diddled mean, out, basically gets diddled out of the Medal of Honor for what he Leroy did. Jenkins, there we go, who, you know, to the internet generation, that means something else entirely. Um, but, uh... No, no, Wasn't no. Leroy that's, Jenkins? That's, Leroy Jenkins was the crewman on Kid that they put into the game. Ah, right, okay. This is, well, who, I was, I'm the one that's this is who I was conflating him with as well. Okay. <laughs> um, but, uh, da, 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 right, no, we've got nothing on Hiryu. So that just leaves Soryu as the obvious. No, no, there's no match to Yamazaki for any of the four carriers that were sunk at Midway. 
well, on the Japanese side. So I think I have to conclude that absent something else coming up, this uh, Yamazaki is just as borderline fictional, fictional yeah. as um, everyone else <laughs> that we've been talking about. I, I see <sighs> Tom just posted something very relevant. Uh, there is a book, Cats in the Navy. Cats in the US Navy, yes. <laughs> The description, like, fans of seeing cute cat photos will love this book as seeing cats in little sailor costumes and sleeping in little cat hammocks is pretty fun. Okay. And then you not try wrong. not to think about their principal job, which was murdering the rat population. <laughs> Although, of interest, a number of ships actually kept dogs for that purpose. Yeah, yeah. Terriers, I suppose, would do very well. Yep, yeah, and more to the point, terriers will hunt... By instinct. Cats will only hunt when they're hungry or when they think it's fun. <laughs> a Yorkshire True. Terrier sees yeah. something smaller than it and fluffy where it shouldn't be, and it's kind of like, D Dogs, generally speaking, a tiny bit more inherently trainable than cats. For only some reason. Yes. It's one of those things where, you know, it's not, it's not like cats don't have the capacity to learn these things, it's just they don't want to. <laughs> They'd just rather do their own thing. I mean, it's not like cats don't learn it. It's just that they don't care that you want them to do yeah, it. Yeah, like, exactly. It's, it's like my cat ne uh, cats know fully well certain things that they shouldn't be doing. It's just that they don't always care. <laughs> Indeed. Yeah, somehow we yes. don't, you know, somehow they've brainwashed us so thoroughly that, that we sort of disregard that and, you know, think they're wonderful regardless. Well, I mean, obviously they are wonderful. Yeah, which brings up the age-old question: Who domesticated who? <laughs> um, I mean, and it's nothing to do with warships at this point, but uh, absolutely. Sure. But who cares? <laughs> uh, Manuel well mentions Yamasaki is also pretty good whiskey. There may have been. Well, if they've been sponsored by whiskey, I feel like they'd mention that other than the name. Yeah, like, I, 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 I hit a lot of distillery references when I was searching around just now as well. So I suspect, again, generic name, coincidence. I mean, it might just be that whoever came up with the name at Wargaming, like the whiskey was like, oh, yeah, sure, we, we, we'll name I mean, somebody after. At, at that Maybe. point, we're getting into the territory of, of partnerships like, you know, Fortnite does partnerships where it's like, you know, the, the Tostitos skin or the Doritos skin or whatever for a warship that's just... Like branding everywhere. But we can be thankful it's not that bad, I suppose. Well, I mean, they I... have like <laughs> the, the things like a sewer lane and such, right? Yeah, but I mean, yeah, they can actual... claim to be related. <laughs> they're, they're games that have some tangential thing to, to ships and not just here's this random brand that we're going to put in. Well, they, yes. they do that in, uh, well, they used to do that in Russia, right? I, I remember them, them bragging think, yeah, about they, that they were of horse ship sausages and stuff like that. Yeah, they would do tie-ins with random products, I suppose, in Russia and things like, you know, go to a fast food restaurant and you get a code for World of Tanks or stuff like that. Yeah, but uh, outside of Russia, they do tend to stick to things that are at least vaguely related. I mean, yes. Verizon got a few tie-ins in the US, but at least Verizon are in the capacity of being an internet service provider. True, yes. And I think they've done some sponsorship for Tawny's as well, if memory serves. But, well, um, I mean, how, how do you fit in Transformers? Okay, I surrender. Or King Kong, <laughs> or Godzilla. Um, yeah. I swear, I, 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 am still waiting for the, I am still waiting for the other shoe to drop on the Kong versus Godzilla deal, because I am still of the opinion that that was half of a deal for something else, and that warships basically got bounced into it. Mind you, we've just seen a whole pile of 40k stuff over in tanks, haven't we? I mean, I'll we're not, we're not okay. on the very, we're not on the very solid argument here, are we? <laughs> 40k does have tanks, so does that oh, definitely? Yes, yes, and in fact, a number of 40k tanks. Well, let's just say Games Workshop took some pretty heavy inspiration on certain yes. vehicles. I, 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 I'm just waiting for a, a Bane Blade skin for the mouse. That, that, would, that Sully, would definitely get me back to World of Tanks. Yes, and Sully, thank you, came up with the name that we've both forgotten, Doris Miller. Oh, there we go. Yes, 
Um, I think they'd actually name me a carrier after him. Which is the ultimate irony, really. Man makes his name shooting down aircraft. Let's name an aircraft carrier <laughs> after him. And he was a cook, not yeah. Him. yeah, I knew there was some I knew there were only a few occupations in the US Navy, but I was I was way off, let's be honest here. So um I will have to go and apologize to the ghost of Mr. Miller at some point. Anyway, back to what was even the original topic at this point? I can't remember. I, mean, I, where we are I think we are so far the down last, the yeah. I think yes, that's that, down that rabbit hole that we weren't coming back up. <laughs> <laughs> uh, so, yes, the last so, year. So, yeah, the CC mutiny. And like I say, in fairness, we have got a better behaved, nicer wargaming out of it, I think. Um, yeah. To, to, to oh, admittedly, it was a pretty bloody traumatic process getting them out of their old ways, but we seem to have succeeded to a degree. The, the phrase also, dragged kicking and screaming definitely comes into effect. Yes. And oh, oh, I just had a thought. With the Russian management now out of the picture, I wonder what effect that's going to have long term. Because that's... so much of the kicking and screaming starts yeah, with them. That, 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 if you, uh, when we say Russian management, you know, ultimately it's still all the Russians that, that moved to Cyprus that, you know, where Wargaming is now headquartered, or has been headquartered for a good number of years at this point, but uh, in terms of the it, management at Leicester, yes, we should probably slightly... Yeah, the management at Leicester are out of the picture to a large degree now. The question is how tell. many of them will... I mean, obviously Leicester needs a management staff still because they continue to operate, but how many of the people will, will stay at Leicester and how many will get offers to move? I wonder. I, I would assume they're prioritizing the technical professionals. Because Probably, but those they... are the guys who are and girls who are irreplaceable. Everybody else, to a degree, you can get locally, or you can bring in staff from Cyprus to just run things until things are spun up. True. Or hey, you could even let some people develop their careers. And would it be a bad? Actually, it might be a bad thing. Um, tech specialists sometimes don't transfer well to management, do they? Well, it's a completely different skill set. True, but it's it's it would usually be helpful if you have management that understands the game as a base, which I'm not sure they currently have. So I feel like it's hard to get worse, but it's always possible. <laughs> oh, I mean, the service could burn tomorrow and they could shut the game down. It could always get worse, but the, the, it's the pessimist says things can't possibly get worse, and the optimist goes, "Oh yes, they can." <laughs> Realist, realist. Anyway, uh, I, I remind you that I work for an organization whose job starts when your day goes straight into the toilet. <laughs> um, but See, I'm, uh, I'm a teacher, my job is to make kids' days go straight into the toilet. <laughs> <laughs> ah, I, I'm that confirms so many suspicions I had about some of my school teachers. But that, yes, my, my job is frequently that, sweeping up the mess. That, that odd <laughs> number of uh, ones that, you know, you, you wonder why they went into the job. Did, you know, did, did they somehow think it didn't involve children? I, I just assumed it was there was a bright, enthusiastic 20-something that volunteered, and now the bitter, caustic 40-something is just marking time until retirement. <laughs> I actually literally had one who was that. Um, for six months. Um, I transferred to school in third year, uh, and we had a teacher in biology whose idea of a lesson was literally reading the textbook. <laughs> okay. I am not exaggerating. Yeah. Literally, word for word, she'd get out the textbook and she'd read it. That's just marking time at that point. Yeah. It was... I spent the first couple of lessons wondering why they were covering stuff in year nine that I covered in year seven. Mm. After the first couple of lessons, I wasn't wondering anymore. Anyway, it, so, it, does, it does kind of remain to be seen long term what yeah. the, uh, the potential management changes will be going but from I, to elsewhere. I, I think they have at least got the potential to come out of this much improved. 
Yes. Um, if only because between the sanctions and the riots and the near mutinies, the old guard have very much been handed their marching orders one way or another. So we'll see. I mean, it needed that clean break from Leicester's upper management, I think. They were setting so much of the culture, Ouija and warships. Yeah. Well, yeah. the warship side of Ouija. Yeah. And now that we've got that, well, hey, let's see where it goes. In some ways, it was sort of arguably a good thing that Wargaming was never... Um, like, Leicester was reasonably independent, and I think that had a positive aspect on the more... Um, the early years of the game, when they're much more focused on the kind of development, development. of mechanics and all that kind of thing. But latterly, when it, it comes to stuff like monetization and certainly some of the, the, the game direction changes with with scene it's been less of a positive thing so it, it, it can kind of swing both ways really yeah i mean we'll see how i'd say the really all we can do is see how they take it hmm. yes um stockholders first into the boat uh maybe tom maybe um mind you the, the stockholders are all in i don't even know if it's wargaming publicly traded in cyprus I have no idea. I, I have, I've never bothered to find out. I don't know if it's privately held or traded. Um, and so I don't, don't know if there are actually any stockholders, but uh, I think a move away from Russian business culture, as it is often perceived in the West, is probably going to be a good thing. Now all they need to do is fix the fact that the gaming design has popped a few leaks. Yeah, that, it would be nice if they fixed that and if they'd focus on... on of fixing the game and uh, making the, the the player experience better again. It's also yeah. like we we were talking about the last year. I feel like the the you guys remember obviously the, the Captain rework. It's still not really that finished. I feel like right there are still like like if you go to to uh, uh, battleships, they still have the what is it? The Furious skill, right? Where you get buffs while you're on fire for four points. Mm. It's a meme skill, but it's just so bad. It's it's worth maybe one it, point it's at best. <laughs> yeah. yeah, it's it, it's yeah. something that because they, they, they sort of rushed out, I feel like the captain skills because they wanted to be ready for subs. Then they applied some band-aids to a few things, but they never really I, achieved the, the idea of more diversity or, or you know, they, there was so much potential in that yeah. thing, but they just... Given, yeah. given how they were presenting it before it actually came out, we, we've definitely fallen far short of, of what it could have been. Perhaps. Um, although I'll note that in any game like this, eventually someone's going to math out an optimum. Mm. And yeah. they have made it a lot more complex than it was. I mean, we have gone from there being, what, a sniper build? a brawling build and a tanking build to, okay, you've now got maybe a couple of builds for each ship and there are several dozen ships. So allowing for overlap, we've got maybe a dozen flavors of captain now. Yeah, I, I, I wouldn't go that. No, it's just really limited by the ship that you're putting I mean, them on. Let's be honest. The thing is, if, if you're like a battleship, you either skill like the defensive skills or you skill like the secondary skills, right? I mean, there might be a little bit of... I mean, option is, is almost human, like in, on the second uh, tier, right? You only skip Grease the Gears if you have a ship with very good short traumas, then you might be able to squeeze in another two-pointer, but it's very yeah. rare because most, most battleships just need that, right? Then, Yeah, and equally on destroys, you've got the core 10. So you yeah. go down the right-hand side and then into concealment expert, and then you've basically got six, seven, eight, nine points to spend to I mean, this, configure to roll. The destroyers sort of have like just a, like a gun build or more like a top build. So there is a little bit of difference, I guess, when it comes to destroyers. For battleships, it's like you, you basically you take what, like a one pointer, possibly emergency repair specialist. It doesn't really matter what you pick. Then you pick probably grease the gears. Then you have adrenaline rush and basics of survivability. And then you have emergency repair, concealment, and fire prevention. And this is like your battleship build. Unless you go for a brawler, there's no reason to switch anything around. Most other skills are by pointless. You can move to another two pointer if a turtle is really good. 
and it's it's just like you know it, there is it, it doesn't really feel like they have improved in in that sense an awful lot as for cruisers you still have like outnumbered and top grade gunner which are meh for for four points the anti-air skills usually make no sense because you aren't going to shoot down many planes anyway mm. so it's like there's just th th there is like the interesting the free torpedo skills that can be fun on some ships but it's you, you're right there is slightly more diversity but they have they have really fallen so far short of what they could have done with this, honestly and there are still so many skills that could use an update or a rebalance or just just yeah. some of them could be replaced so along with an overhaul of some of the older tech tree lines we can now add an overhaul of the skill system at the basically year and a half mark I mean, see, that's the thing, right? If you overhaul the skill system, you expect it to remain at least relevant for a short time because you made it in that environment and then as the game progresses, maybe it becomes obsolete. Like, we've had an original skill system, right? And then there was the overhaul where we got RPF back in the day. But that skill system sort of worked relatively well. There were the, the carrier rework killed some skills, but until then it was sort of all right-ish, right? And then with the carrier rework, we had some bad skills in there that they never addressed until like uh, with the new rework. But then the new rework stayed as they, it, it felt for me rushed. It felt like they didn't have enough time to actually consider a lot of those skills. And then when they had to replace them, they rushed even harder with, with like replacements. And then the whole option to actually see which skills are active, which is pretty vital with this system. Is something that they live at half a year later. It's it's just sad because I feel like there would have been a lot of potential to to with, with like the unique trees to really work on the strengths or weaknesses of ships or really fit in their roles. Yeah, absolutely. And and another revamp if they can ever spare the time with all the mess that's going mm. on would be very well overdue. Do I agree with you that the skill rework fell short of what it could have been? Yes. Do I think it was a complete failure over the old system? No. Because, okay, talk about the old system. I just think remember having exactly maybe two destroyer skill builds, if that. And one carrier build and two battleship builds, one for mid to long range and one for brawling. Basically German. I mean... Um, well, what, what I will say is... Things haven't is, changed that much, I will, yeah. I will say. So but what I will say is, the, the good thing is that you have an actual... This is a good thing, also a little sad, that you have now a different, like, uh, different skills for each class. Because this gives... This is a good change, right? But the sad thing yes. is, this is, there is so much potential now, because you no longer have to consider, oh, what if, 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 if like, a destroyer takes the skill, it was moment for battleship, or what if... Like, we would want tank skills just for battleships, but we don't want cruisers to become to tank, or whatever it is that you want from your design, you can now limit it to a ship class. But they have absolutely, like, they, they've made a limited use, but they're like, oh yeah, like, IFAG is now different cost depending on what ship you are. But that's about, like, it, it feels like. And, oh yeah, cruisers can't take secondary skills anymore, which is a bit sad, because it would have been fun on certain ships, so. Mm. Yeah. Yeah, I'd say it was an improvement, but it fell short of what it could have been, and another pass might not be a bad thing. It it would be, I and mean, this was kind of off the back of a um, uh, little white mouse did a, a review on I can't remember which, what it, what it was now. One of the like she's got a huge backlog. She took a bit of a break, but uh, she recently did a uh, a review for the first time in a while, and she was. I mean, she was more specifically talking about equipment slots and how basically, like, for 99% of the, the time, if you have access to the concealment module, then you take the concealment module. But that's kind of also true for, like, 99% of the time, you take concealment expert, and there's not really any kind of viable alternative. You know, there's, there's, there's no kind of... Uh, instead of, I'm going to have this much extra concealment, I'm going to have this much extra, like, you know, a, a dispersion buff against enemy ships trying to shoot at me because the, the closest we have is the dazzle skill on destroyers, and that only has a 
a fairly limited duration. So and a fairly limited utility yeah. as well, from what I recall. I experimented with it a bit, but it. Uh, <sighs> I always you... found the better advice was just to disappear and not get shot at all. Yeah. The problem is you really can't fit it into most builds because there's so many other stuff that you want. I tried running Nestl on some ships, but it's like you can, you you don't have the four points to spare. I think I've tried it on one French destroyer, and then you know next time there's a free reset, I will probably reset that captain and pick something different. But yeah, so that that I mean that that struck me as a thing is that there's still this absolute primacy, just based on the way the vision system works in World of Warships of of. Um, being able to stealth yeah. up when there isn't really any kind of uh, alternative to that. I mean, I, I, what, what I will say is, in, in when it comes to captain skills, I'm fine if there is like one that that you sort of have to pick or that everyone picks because, mm. as as you sure touched upon earlier, in, in most games there is the cookie cutter build that you can run. But at least the ideal way of of a captain skill build is that there might be some base skills that everyone takes, and then you have a few that that are optional where you have act, feel like you have actual choice, right? Or you can pick something. But well, with the you... modules, as you put on it, it's a much bigger problem because you've one slot for for that module, and if everyone runs the same thing, it's a lot more boring. Yeah, I mean, it it's a tangled mess, basically. I think it's the easiest conclusion here. Yeah, I, I, you know, to be fair to Walker, I think mean, it's it's really hard to come up with perfect foolproof systems for for stuff like this. So you know, I mean, it, it's it's not I even mean, that. I mean. Really. You, you just, even if there is a cookie cutter build, you just have to have an alternative that's close enough. Like, for example, running secondary brawling builds is usually not, I mean, maybe with the, with the new chamber, but, but for like a core first, right? You will, on average, do better if you just go the boring old tanking, like sniping build, because secondaries are just too situational. And you can make the build absolutely work, and it's a lot more fun than playing anything else, but it's not going to be like the, the best thing you can do, right? It's not going to be the cookie cutter build. But and it's one of those things where if you've invested that heavily into it, then it really should give you a, a, an yeah. almost slightly disproportionate benefit for those situations where you do get to use it, because otherwise so it's... So it's is that a skill problem, a ship problem, or a metagame problem? I mean, it's, it's, a, it's a combination <laughs> of the metagame and basically the, the design of the game, because... The, the the fact is right getting close means you're going to be like the frontlining ship and it's going to mean like a lot of people are shoot you it basically it's what, what we'd call like accidental focus fire in a sense right most people shoot the closest ship to them even if they don't coordinate if you have one ship that goes too far forward it's going to be focused down and there is just too much damage that that you can't tank so you can't like close the gap and if you invest a lot into your close range, like secondaries, I mean, close range at 12 and a half kilometers, it's almost medium range already. So, but you, you need the right position. You need like the right islands and you need the right amount of your ships versus enemy ships on that side. And oftentimes you're just forced to maybe kite away because you're outnumbered. And it's just like, in essence, it's a situational build, a situation that you can't necessarily force. So if you are not ending up in a situation, then you've wasted all of your points. And really, the absolute ideal like brawling secondary build would also involve all of the survivability skills, which you just cannot do. That, that's so, a bit of a contradiction always, right? Yeah. Because you don't need the survivability skills at long range, you need them at close range. But at close range, you don't have the points to spec in the survivability. So if you spec a long range battleship, you're going to be more survivable than if you spec a close range battleship, which is, it doesn't make much sense. Yeah. Yeah. It's actually interesting because instead of the whole speed, armor, firepower trilogy, Trinity, we now have close range, long range tanking as our trinity to, of balance in well, battleships in particular. I mean, there isn't really much long range. Long range, you trust skill tanking. Because, I mean, they okay. tried going more long range skills with like Dead Eye. Oh, yeah, Dead Eye. <laughs> we saw <laughs> they, they had to remove that. Because the problem is, battleships were not like long range battleships already have the advantage over short range ones. And they were not balanced for skills that improved them, right? While second is were always built around skills. So basically, if you add long range skills to the game, you'd have to rebalance all sniping battleships. So 
we we are at at like a weird part because you you could make ships like battleships a lot weaker at long range and then offer them skills to take so that they get effective at long range that would make sense right that you have to invest in it but it's like basically ships are built for like longer range and you are free to take defensive skills at that point and if you want to get closer range you need to specialize in that and give up tanking So definitely, definitely a lot left to be desired when it comes to captain skills. But you know that just means it's room for improvement in the future, right? Definitely. What what I think would have been an interesting point is that I mean you keep it that like each ship class has its own uh, skill skill set, but you could have just you could have give um, it you could have split it further. Like you have a battleship skill tree and the battleship skill tree is split in like three parts in like mobility. Uh, uh, defense and offense, right? And then you have an offense line, and one is like close range, and one is like, and you have different points for each line, right? And then you have an, a close range and a long range offense line, and you have maybe some defensive options, more like against torpedoes or more like against fires or something like that. And then maybe you have a mobility option that that is also tailored to to different situations, maybe more of speed or more of concealment or whatever, right? So that. That you are a little bit more focused, but in a sense, it, it means that if everybody specs into some offensive skills, you can balance around that and then just have to choose between going more the, the closer range route or the longer range route. Or you could I... just have defensive skills baked into the, the close range skills, right? Like the, mm. uh, the skill that gives you better secondaries and forms, like if you are closer to a target, you you uh, heal fires f uh, faster or something like that. Yeah, there's, there's like, there, there certainly could be a, there could be more interesting things done even within just existing skills. Like you say, like, there's very few skills that have um, multiple effects that are sort of all useful at the same time. Um, so, yeah, that, that could be. That could be useful. Um, and the other thought I had was, you know, there's there's maybe room for, but we have we have national flavors in terms of like ship designs and capabilities. Uh, you know, it, it in, in theory could also be applied to captains. So you know, there's there's different emphasis on different skills in different in different you know captain trees. So. Um, because we we sort of have that effect in that you know special captains can have buffs to certain things and it's like what, what if that was applied more broadly so you know you get a, an extra point or or two of uh, uh secondary accuracy when you take secondary skills on german battleships and because at the moment stuff like that just tends to be baked into the ships themselves but that would also then i guess require maybe rebalancing some ships so i, I don't know how mm, yeah. brilliant an idea that is but uh i just thought i had I suspect that anything like that is going to be a fairly extensive project. So mm. it, it's, it, it's it is something that probably needs to be done, but it, don't look for it happening anytime soon with all the shenanigans that are going on. Would be my I mean, observation. I, I definitely like the idea, but it's probably a little bit too late. It, that's something that you'd have to run with, I think, fairly early on when there aren't too many ships. Otherwise, it it's might just be hard to rebalance. Then again, if it's small enough bonuses, maybe you could get away with it. Yeah, because that, that would preserve the, the, the specialness of, uh, of the unique captains. Um, and, you know, it would slightly emphasize certain characteristics in certain nations, I suppose. But, yeah. I mean, you could even have, since, since we have happens with like those those passive active skills you could even go so far as give them like an an active skill slot or so where you can slot skills and then have difference for for each nation or something like that it would also by i mean it's it doesn't make that much sense that you have just the, the legendary captains that are more powerful than others in some ways a lot more powerful like it it feels like they have Ever since the Italian battleships and the Italian destroyers, they have built them around Sansonetti, right? For for the increased range. It looks like they yeah. genuinely built uh, 
them around that cap that you can only have on one ship and not everybody <laughs> has which is a bit mad but why not give every captain like at least the legendary captain maybe have two two slots where he can equip something and then the regular captain have one slot where he can equip something so there is still a little bit of that and then have each nation have different options to choose from that might be interesting yeah, it would be interesting. If, 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 like the, what they do with the the, the legendary upgrades in in World of Tanks, where you have to choose. Uh, well, you don't have to, but if if you if you grind them out with XP, you you get to choose. You know, you get this buff to mobility, but it comes at this nerf to firepower kind of thing. Um, if you could apply that to a sort of uh, a general captain things on individual ships or even you know entire nations where you could be like okay i want to emphasize survival skills a bit but it'll come at the cost of reload speed or you know i think there's room to play with that idea definitely although that that probably makes balancing overall a bit harder but it, it just depends how big you make the buffs and nerfs i suppose True. It's got to be big enough to feel worth doing, but it can't be so big that it just creates completely unbalanced things. Which is um, so, some of the, the things you can stack together on some tanks in, in World of Tanks can make the tanks a bit ridiculous in some ways. We'll put it that way. Yeah, um, like I say, it is going. If they do it, it's going to be a long and very involved project. So mm-hmm. hopefully, if they ever do decide to do it, they will caucus round for ideas. From the community first. And <laughs> hey, we've been talking about a kinder, nice, kinder, gentler, nicer wargaming of late. I mean, uh, just because they ask for feedback doesn't mean they're obliged to deal with it, as, as we true. are all very well aware. Yes. You gotta keep those shredders fed. Now, now. <laughs> Uh, I, I've seen some. I've seen some feedback that justly belonged in a shredder. Well, that's so, that's uh, always yes. Uh, but right. So, uh, have we anything else to cover? I mean, we could bang on about submarines a bit, and we kind of already have. <laughs> but I mean, that's uh, still that's uh, still one, one aneurysm is enough for a single podcast. <laughs> um. Yeah, so, yeah, uh, I mean, uh, I don't know if there's anything else really on the portal. There's more, as you touched on, there's more Azure Lane stuff. Um, the auction that we've talked about on yeah, the, the Lighthouse. Uh, current so, public test of the next patch. The usual routine. Yeah, current um, midway missions, which I don't know if you have to opt into them or if they just appear, but uh, those are a thing. I think you have to... Uh opt in to some of that stuff you certainly have to opt into all the anime stuff yeah um but other than that i think not and this may well be the first sign of a development wobble it's been a fairly quiet week which is not a bad thing considering yeah. some of the loud weeks we have had in this game over the I mean, year but some uh, weeks just kind of are so i don't know if i would read yeah. too much into that but yes yeah. but uh we shall see although we, we have now like because i was away last week we didn't have a podcast last week so this is like the week of uh, the news of two weeks and it's barely yeah, the, here, so. in that context there hasn't been very much i suppose yeah that's, yeah that's i mean cool. the only other thing of note really is that the french um uh, well, they're calling them cruisers, but I'm looking at those designs and the French Dunkirks. And... Yes, yes. Uh, are I mean, he didn't have have particularly much anything to say about them when he was last on, so it was just like, yep, it's a Bunch line of, of Dunkirk designs for Dunkirk and Richelieu, probably. So, yes, not not much to say about them, really. They exist. They exist. They exist. Um, there, are, there are going to be some very hiked eyebrows, but they exist. Yes. Um, clan battles are back. Uh, Dockyard, I believe, is wrapping up. Yes, yes. last couple days. So, you know, You've got your last either. few days to chuck you in your grind like mad or, 
Or get ready to open your wallet if you're yeah. land to know, yes. Um, let's see, we've mentioned arms race. Uh, the mini-map. Oh, yes, there is a new setting that people might want to be aware of on the mini-map. Show exact location in a square. Yes, when you ping now, yeah, that's yes. one of the changes that came with the, recent, the most recent update. Um, I mean, there were some vague overall differences with, like, Button shading and things like that. Yes, that's probably but the most this fun. this is a setting that you have to enable in the minimap settings, and it that has the potential to be very very useful. I'm I'm actually a little surprised that it's not on by default. Mm. Um, well, gaming isn't very good with turning things on by default. Yeah, like, I mean the the alternate interface mode that adds a whole bunch of extra very useful information. I think that's still something you have to go and. Turn yeah, yeah, but you do, but there's a good reason for that because a new player might end up with information overload. As a uh, yeah, I suppose. I mean, it's, it's, so, thing, at least it, there it is, seeing hit there points, seeing hit points of ships is not an information overload. <laughs> 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 it's it's pretty essential. If you st if you How? reinstall the game, you don't see the hit points of. But you do still get the health bar. No, no, um, you don't. You don't see the health bar. No? Oh, okay. You have to activate like the, the interface, right? You, you just see the ships. Yeah. Oh, yes. And of course, Leningrad, Exeter, and Ishizuchi are being replaced with containers in the community tab. Mecklenburg is live, I believe. Yes, Six, steel. 16,305 millimeter guns. I, I, have, I have been wondering about how I know this is probably data we'll never get to know exactly, but how Italian destroyers have been doing. I've, uh, I, I still, I still think they they really aren't worth grinding through to the the top tiers, especially I, the, the tier ones can be kind of fun. But I have not had tier much, seven. Yeah, it's too unforgiving at the higher them. tiers unless you're extremely dedicated. So I, yeah, I wonder if it'll be like the uh, like we've just seen with the the battle wagons. If we'll see some. More, um, more tweaks sort of later on, yes. changes to those. I mean, yes. the, the the problem is that they just don't have a concept that works at tier ten. Uh, at yeah, least I like have not I, I have the I, tiers, but... Well, they they kind of did have a concept, didn't they? Basically, do an entire line of Paolo Emilio's. No, no, it's it's well, not like that because no you don't have the torpedo damage to Yolo anymore. You can't sink oh. at your ten ship with your torpedoes because you don't do enough damage. That's a problem because yeah. the YOLO really does depend on there not being anything to see her when so her smoke's In other words, out. you have to really hang around until there are damaged ships to actually fully do that. And yeah, you have you about just, you just throwing your ship away. I mean, it obviously depends on torpedo protection and so on, but you have about half, roughly, if, if you manage to hit all of your eight top, you have about half a your 10 battleship worth of damage in, in a rush. Mm. So, right. assuming so you can hit all of them, so it's it's uh, it's it's not a it's more of a not a death strike, more of a finish off a wounded battleship if you can get in there. Okay, so almost a YOLO, but you need no, to be no, a bit not more almost. And... YOLO has, I think, about four times the damage in torpedoes. Right. Okay. So, a, so a quarter YOLO. Right. Yeah. It's 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 uh, uh, it's a budget YOLO. Bit. They're, they're much closer in damage. To, I think the Swedish destroyers have less damage, but of course, much faster torpedoes. And much, faster, much faster reload. reload. Yeah. Yeah. And the tighter hmm. sprint. So, so, yeah, they're, they're, they're a weird line. And I think we might see some changes coming to them at some point. But maybe. given that it's a war game, again, it might be a while. The, well, the, also, the problem is that. You sort of have decent sap against other destroyers, but you can't really spot them yourself because your mm. concealment is so bad. Like, what, what really kills them is that you have, like, French destroyer concealment, but you don't have guns that work at long ranges. And unless oh. your speed boost is running, you don't really have the ability to dodge anything. Like, you have a very fast speed boost, but it's very short duration, so you can't mm. fall for. So, so basically, you are in a ship that can't long-range gunboat because it doesn't have the range. You can't even mount the range module. There is no option to mount the range module. It, it's, on this. A, it's a very like, the most kind thing you could say about it is it, it's a it's a very niche line, <laughs> but it, yes. it is quite a confused set of. But it, um, it's not the niche line. In it's just appeals to certain people and it, it has its role on the ship. It's it's it, it just doesn't know what it wants to do mm. because the torpedoes are extremely bad for Yolo. 
you don't have the the you can't really open water gunboat. You can gunboat while in smoke. Like you, well, the best you can do is just use your smokes to to pew pew a little, but you also have to you still have to get fairly close and don't expect that much out of it. And then hope that your very slow, reasonably ranged torpedoes hit something at some point. I, I mean, they even could have done something else. Sort of, uh, it's a bit of an old thought at this point of mine, but you know, give, giving them an option of smoke generator, so you could have the classic crawling smoke where you have to be going along at quarter speed, but it lasts a lot longer. Or you get the the fuel smoke, which lets you potentially disengage at high speed. Or engage at high speeds, and you know that could have offered a bit of a playstyle difference. But yeah, but they're, they're they're a bit weird. Anyway, yeah, um, yeah. we're kind of going into almost an old topic at that point. So, is is there anything else, or should we start wrapping things up? I don't think I've got anything else that I'd wanted to cover. Yeah, I think that's about it. All right. Well, you know, it's been we've we've somehow been going for a year already, so. Yes, and we're still Happy here. Happy anniversary, everyone, I guess. Woo! I'm sure, was some streamers uh, that could have popped. <laughs> you can edit an effect in then after. This. Yeah, yeah, I'll, I'll, I'll definitely do that. We, we, we'll add some post, yeah. Yeah. And the cat ears, I still have to remember to do that. I somehow forget every time you're on, but, you know, one of these days. Excellent. My plan to induce amnesia is still working. <laughs> <laughs> So, uh, yeah, thanks everyone for watching. We'll be back next week. And thank you, sir, for joining us once more. You're welcome. Thank you for having me. I suppose uh, have a good night, everyone. Bye. Bye. Bye.